Emma. Huh? Emma. 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 Nouveau de trèfle maxify, vraiment plus large. So the bottom line, technology is not the solution to everything, and I'm not here to say that technology is the solution. Um, I think we need to look at things slightly differently and understand technology is not the solution. Teachers, lecturers are the solution. What technology is, is an opportunity. And when we see technology in the right place, it changes everything. It's not something we throw at the problem. We have to think about the problem and how we can use this tool like we would have used any tool prior to. Famous Lewis Carroll quote from a famous book, if you don't know where you're going, any road will get you there, was said to Alice Barr, was it the Cheshire Cat or something, when she didn't know where she was going. I want to add Craig's version of it. If you don't know why you're going, you'll never start. So there are two important things that come out there. The one is having a destination, and the other is knowing why you even want to get to that destination. I don't know how many of you have heard of, of Simon Sinek, he does a really, really interesting TED talk. It's, it's extremely popular, so jot it down, maybe have a look at it later. And his whole message is about, you have to start with the why. And his talk is about why companies like Apple are so effective compared to many other tech companies that are out there. So at the end of the day, they all have a what. They all have a technology. But there's something about Apple that makes people like me, fanboy, Apple phone, Apple watch, Apple laptop, stand in line people. And he's saying, what is it? It's because they have a why that is at the center of their company, and that is to think differently. And people buy into that. And even if the products might be very similar, we would argue that they're not, because that why is so important. And so his message is really, on any journey or any business or any adventure you're going out on, as this is, we've got to get that why in place up front. And so, that is what we want to look at. So essentially, we've got a couple of questions therefore that we want to answer in this first little bit. Why do we want to do this thing with technology? Very important. Secondly, and it may seem obvious, what is it that you actually want to do with this technology that you're going to put into your classroom? And then thirdly, how are you going to do it? So those are the three questions. So whether we are starting a business or going on a journey of trying to put tech into our classrooms, why do we want to do it? What is it you're actually trying to achieve so you know that you're arriving at the right place and how do you plan to get there? So let's start with the why. Why would we want to even be here? Why would we want to be, why would we care about technology and trying to bring it into our classrooms and, and to impact our students with it? Well, maybe this uh, sort of helps answer the question. 50 million users, that's a, that's a lot of users for a, an app or a website or something to get or anything. It took cars 62 years to reach 50 million users. Um, it took the telephone 50 years to get to that same number. Uh, electricity took 46 years before it got to 50 million people using it. And TV was 22 years. So as the technology comes in, TV's real technology, we're getting a little faster. The World Wide Web reached 50 million in just seven years. YouTube took four years to get to 50 million. Facebook did it in just three years. Twitter, surprisingly, in just two years. Instagram, in 18 months. Pokemon Go, in 19 days. <laughs> and we're seeing it get faster and faster. Imagine reaching 50 million users using your platform in just 19 days. And probably as I speak, there's one that's done it in five days, 10 days, one hour. And so that's the world we're living in. It's just astronomical change. Things are landing and impacting millions and millions of people at literally the speed of light. And so when we look at our students and their average day, we see it's changed how they are doing things. They, they're not spending too much time on exercise. They're at their schooling or education for about six hours, sleeping seven hours, but nine hours of their day now is on technology. 
And as this tech hits them faster and faster, that nine hours is probably going to become 10 hours, 11 hours, and probably why Brian couldn't sleep, as he said, he's probably on WhatsApp or he's probably on Instagram or Snapchat talking to his friends. And so this is changing our lives. It's changing how we interact. It's changing how we, we socialize. But it's also starting to change how we learn. And so there was some research that went around not long ago, uh, shared by Microsoft and others, that apparently said that a goldfish now beats the human's attention span by one second. And so whether that's true or not, the interesting part is that we don't have very long attention spans. We're switching all the time. And that's a reality. We can say we don't like it, but that's just what's happened. And so how do we deal with it? And so we're ending up with students with a contagious student disorder, highly contagious, pedosomnogy, teaching-induced sleep. Now, the reason it's contagious is watch one person yawn and watch it just start going around. And so if I go on too long here after lunch, pedosomnogy sets in. And you've all seen it in your own lectures. You talk and talk and and they're gone. It's beautiful to see. So sometimes you actually wish that someone would do that for you when you're battling to sleep, come and lecture you as you lie in your bed. So we're losing our students. And so the bottom line, why are we here? Why do we think we want to go on this journey? Because our students have changed and technology has changed dramatically. It's not new technology. Concept technology is not new. The, the blackboard was technology. The pencil was technology. It's just the rate at which that technology is now changing and being introduced. And so that brings us to our next question. Okay, so we want to go on this journey. Fantastic. We, we motivated. We've got the why. Okay, so I'll ask you the question, what is it that you're hoping to achieve? What is your destination? This is the old thing. We can set out on a journey together and say, you want to go with me on holiday? Yes, yes, we all. We've got the why, but I want to go to Joburg and you want to go to Cape Town. Those are totally different places. And so the what. And so you might say, well, it's simple. I want to digitize my classroom. Excellent. And that's a common thing. We want to digitize a school, digitize a university, and we have projects to do that. Oh, that sounds good. And so with great enthusiasm, we rush like lemmings over the cliff and fall down, and we think, what went wrong? I knew clearly what I wanted to do. And so I wanted to bring this technology in and, and change things, and then all of these reports hit us, whether they're research reports or media reports telling us how technology is a disaster. Like depressing and we were so excited we had that why pounding in our heart and then we discover this is not working very well our students are actually better off if they don't have it in the classroom and so we need to answer this question very carefully what are you trying to do because it seems logical but if you don't understand what you're trying to do it's going to become very difficult to actually do that now one of the things I've noticed is a confusion of the goal of the what and typically what happens is this is what most people end up aiming for they want to use the technology to make them more efficient teachers and it's driven by a whole lot of people it's driven by vendors who come and say we've got this cool lms that will allow you to upload your stuff faster will allow you to get your student marks and it's driven by it departments because what are it departments about they're about efficiencies I'm from IT. What do we do? We make businesses efficient. So they come, if you use this, it'll, it'll streamline your process. You'll put it in here and it'll ripple through. It's often driven by management. What is management interested in? They're interested in the bottom line. They're interested in getting more through for less. And so we say, well, yeah, we bring in technology. It'll make us more efficient. But that's not what we are actually aiming for. We're not a factory. We're not a business. We're in the game of education we're interested in effectiveness and so when you take that technology there is a huge difference in using technology to make you efficient as compared to using technology to make you effective and so what often happens is a university or a school rolls out the tech and that right hand side is all met but it makes zero difference on our teaching because all it's done is make us more efficient and not make us more effective and so this is classically what we see. We're, we're a cool university who doesn't have blackboards. We've got smart boards. Wow, it's saved on chalk. We're more efficient. 
or we don't have books, we've got ebooks. Isn't this fantastic? We've saved costs on books, and the students carry less books around. It's not effectiveness, it's efficiency. Or we don't have normal lectures, we, we videoed them and uploaded them all to Moodle. And now they can watch those boring videos this size instead of the real thing. Cheaper. You can, you can distribute them better. And so none of those in themselves are wrong, but they are achieving, in my view, the wrong goal. They are efficiency goals, not effectiveness goals. And so we end up with this illusion. I love that street art. It's an illusion. You can actually walk over that, you'll be fine. It's nothing there. It's just a drawing. But we have this illusion of something, and we believe we are doing something, but we actually are not. And so ask the question again, what is it we are trying to achieve with technology? I developed this little matrix, which I call the Educational Technology Assessment Model. And basically, it's got two elements to it. So on the one side, it's got content. So when you're using technology, are the people, your students, consuming content or producing content? And on the other axis, it's got learning. Are they passively involved or are they actively involved? And by the way, if you get a chance, we're not going to do it now. If you go to that link up there, bit.do forward slash ETA dash test, you can actually do a little self-assessment of your, of your teaching and your teaching style. So what are the options? Well, you could be just a passive consumer. You use technology in a passive consumption way, or you could be a, an active consumer when it comes to teaching with technology, a passive producer, or you could be in that quadrant where you and your students are involved in active producing. So I'll give you some examples. If what you're using in your, in your lectures, in your lessons, are videos and ebooks, typically that's passive consumption. What we're doing now is passive consumption. You're not doing much. You're just listening, and that leads to pedosomnogy eventually. But some of us get pretty excited, and we bring in some apps and games. That's great, and they are, they are, they are good. They make the person, the students, active, but they're not producing anything. At the end of it, they've been more engaged, but it still tends to be relatively consuming. We may have a smart board or some sort of social network thing where there is a level at which they're producing, but it's very low scale. Maybe they hit print on the smart board and it sends something to, to the printer or to their phone or whatever it is. The ideal is to get us to that quadrant, and that's what you're going to experience today, that active producer quadrant. And all of these, whether they're games, apps, ebooks, videos, smart boards, I will show you how you can take some of those and move them into that quadrant. And to me, that is what we want to achieve. An engaged learner, someone who is so excited about what they're doing that even if the thing like today goes on for eight hours, which it probably will, <laughs> you will not notice as Brian continues the session and I've had. <laughs> so, why? Because our students and technology have changed. What do we want to achieve? We want to achieve effective teaching, not efficient, totally different places and destinations. And so that comes down to the very important how. It's wonderful to have a passion, it's wonderful to have a destination, but do we know how, or is there no how? At this point, we are going to run a very short experiment, a uh, social experiment. So, we well, need to, Brian, I'll tell you what, if you can pick for me, uh, three, I need three groups of two. So two, two, two. Sort of like the bishop. Yes. So choose two, another two, and another two. So it's totally random. Okay. What has now happened is I've given them all actually a very similar thing. I'm going to give them two minutes. Brian, you can tell me. We'll see how far they got in two minutes. Okay. Uh, they've got to assemble what they've been given in two minutes. Okay, as best as they can. Right, let me very quickly tell you uh, what happened there. The far team, that's why I wasn't involved in selecting them, so I couldn't be blamed. The far team, they were all the same items, had all the pieces, they didn't have the box, and they had no instructions. The middle team had all the pieces and the box. And this team had all the pieces, the box, and instructions. And an engineer. And an engineer. <laughs> and it was interesting to watch them. So obviously the first team there sat there going, what the heck are all these pieces? <laughs> the bottom line is they had no what. They didn't even know 
where their destination was. So it was just confusing. And by trial and error, I eventually got a moon rover or some park thing, whatever. The middle team knew what they were going to try and achieve. They could see the picture. But still, it's not easy to get those little pieces together because there's too many. As you'll see, they've got a whole pile of extra ones over there. The third team had the vision, but also had the how. And I watched them going through the instructions and they quite got a, oh, those two. Oh, I said, oh, those two, which I would never have figured out even if there was an engineer on the team. And so the bottom line is, it is very important to have the vision, to know what you want, as was said to Alice, but you also need to know how you're going to get there. And that is what we want to look at now and through the rest of today. And so one of the models that deals with teaching and technology is TPAC. And basically it says there are three elements when we come to teaching. We need technology, we need pedagogy, and we need content knowledge. Those are the three aspects that we require. But typically what happens is we have great technology. We have all the IT people to support us uh, as lecturers and academics, as teachers. We have the content knowledge, but the thing we don't have are the appropriate pedagogies to help us bring that all together. And if we don't have that how, we sit like the others with all these pieces saying, how? And what do we do? Sometimes they click together and you go, yes, I got it. And then the next day you get given another pile of these things and it doesn't click together. And you're like, ah, oh, just when I thought I had it figured out. And so that how is very important. And so that is what this approach is all about. So the approach that we're going to be looking at today is a called the Activated Classroom Teaching Approach. And basically it is a taxonomy, an arrangement of pedagogies that are very easy to apply in the classroom. And so what we've been doing so far is total consumption, except for a few people that got to do something a little active there. We're going to look at each of these. We're going to look at curation, how curation is about bringing lots of things together into one place and how effective that is as a teaching method. We're going to look at conversation, how we can actually engage in a conversation in this environment, whether there was 10, 20 or 100 of you, and we'll see how that gets your brains ignited. We're going to look at the power of learning through mistakes and the power of correction as a pedagogy. We're then going to look at creation as a pedagogy, how when you create artifacts, it improves your memory, your recall. And the top one, we're going to have a little fun thing right at the end. We're going to experience a little bit of stress and chaos to finish you off and head you out. So when it comes to a how, it can't just be any how. We need something in my view, firstly, that is easy. Now, this little puzzle with the, with the pieces, I would freak out with that anyway. I just look at that instructions and just give up. So when it comes to teaching and the pedagogies that support it, it has to be something that is easy to apply, otherwise we're not going to do it. But more than easy, it also has to be effective. It could be easy, for example, put up a YouTube video, but is it effective? And ultimately, to me, it must be empowering. Not only because our students are wanting to be more involved in the, in the learning process, but even when we start to look at these terms like decolonization, part of that process is changing how our students are teaching and learning. We don't have to continue to do it in these old 3,000-year-old ways. And so is it empowering? And so, easy. The approach we're going to have a look at, as I said, the activated classroom <coughs> teaching approach, is basically five recipes five cards, five pedagogies. They can work by themselves, they can work together. And each of them, if we focus on that, we'll find that the technology is very effective. And so we have a whole pile of technologies and we're gonna to touch on a few of those. We've only got a little bit of time here, so we're just gonna to touch on a few very quickly. But what's nice is once you start to understand them from a pedagogy basis, they all fit beautifully into wonderful ways of being used. We suddenly understand the how. We also understand why we are using those technologies. And so we're going to touch on a few of those. The second thing is, if we're going to have an approach, it must be effective. Most of you probably know, but you just look at the research when it comes to active teaching. Massive improvements in recall, massive improvements in concentration. And so we want to have an approach that gets the people active. And in fact, in this last little thing we did, the people that got the most out of it are the ones that were here because they were active. Student impact. There's nothing nicer than getting your students coming back and saying something like this. This is so awesome source stuff, whatever that means. 
Finally, a teacher lecturer understands the way we learn. If a learner can't understand the way you teach, teach them the way the learner can learn. And so we want our students to come back and go, wow, I just love this. It resonates with me. But not only that, we want the people who are involved, the teachers, the lecturers who are doing it to say, you know what? When I use these approaches, I see the difference. I, I did it in my class. It was easy, but I saw an immediate impact because ultimately the teachers, the lecturers, the students, everyone must be impacted by it. But more than that, there needs to be something beyond that. Because when our students leave here, it's not just their content knowledge that's going to be important. It's the developing of these 21st century skills. And so each of these pedagogies is also specifically designed to encourage the development of key things like problem solving and initiative and persistence. And you're going to leave here with some extra persistence and some critical thinking and some extra risk-taking skills. You will leave here new people. So it's all about empowering. And so how are we going to do it? Well, we had a goal. And the goal was, can we produce educators who are transformational? We're living in an era of disruption. Can we produce educators that go into their classroom and are actually changing the way we are teaching and learning? It's a very noble goal. It's a high goal. But that's what we hope to achieve. And so the overall plan is basically this. It's got four parts to it that essentially move you from what's called unconscious incompetence, not knowing what you don't know, to knowing what you don't know, consciously incompetent, to consciously competent, knowing how to do it, but you've got to focus on it, to the ultimate, where you do it and it's part of your DNA. And that's a normal process that we all go through, whether you're learning to drive a car or learning to drive technology. And so the objective of the first part, which was the seminar, is basically to explain why this is important. The objective of the second part, which is the workshop, is to show you what is possible. Now again, this is only a couple of hour session, I can't train you, but I want to expose you to what is possible. The next part is experience. That's actually some training on how to do all of this. And finally, extending it and impacting others. So our strategy basically is to get you thinking, to get you trying today, to get you involved in some teaching and ultimately transform. And so the approach, as we said, the first was the seminar, get your brains to understand, yes, I know why I want to go on this journey and where I want to go. Today, it's the workshop. It's all about interacting and identifying. And hopefully that'll identify some people that are really keen to take this forward for some online training and ultimately to spread the good news to the whole world. So that's basically it. At this point, you need to get ready to... Are you ready? <laughs>